Let's go to Virginia in the United States. Benjamin Hopkins is there, a professor of history and international relations at George Washington University, also a fellow at the Council on Foreign Relations. Professor, thank you so much indeed for your time. The whole idea of inclusivity seemed to go out of the window pretty quickly. In fact, The Guardian, the British newspaper, is quoting the uh, Taliban's uh, deputy head of its cultural commission who's spoken to an Australian broadcaster, and this gentleman says, I don't think women will be allowed to play cricket. Yeah, in many ways, this is both expected in the sense of this is the Taliban, um, as it were, showing that the stripes remain on the tiger rather than have changed. Um, at the same time, given the at least noises it was publicly making to be more inclusive, uh, a little bit surprising. Um, one thing I would note is that this is the interim government. So there's definitely some politics at play here where I think there's probably a calculation of what the Taliban, as it were, can get away with vis-a-vis -vis the international community. Um, so, you know, how long this interim government lasts and what type of permanent government it will give way to, I think is definitely something that many people will be paying attention to at this point. Yeah, and Washington's reaction, uh, possibly the most pertinent in terms of how its allies around the world react. And the appointment of Haqqani as interior minister, this is a man who is part of a network, the Haqqani network, which is designated as a terrorist group by the United States. And then you have Akun, the prime minister, who's on the UN blacklist. I mean, how can any nations recognize this government? The problem that the Biden administration is going to run into is the fact that, in essence, the Biden administration recognized the Taliban two years ago when it started the Doha negotiations, in which it purposely excluded the Ghani government of Afghanistan. So it, it's going to be really difficult, in a practical sense, for the Biden administration to walk back what was, in fact, a de facto recognition over the past two years. Uh, it was really interesting in the clip you shared uh, the president talking about Afghanistan's neighbors being nervous. And I think that really reflects the um, calculus of the Biden administration that this is no longer their problem and that they are going to hold it at arm's length. If I could add one thing about the interim government, let's also remember that uh, the Taliban has announced there will be a resurrection of the ministry for the propagation of virtue and prevention of vice, the kind of religious police. Uh, I don't believe they filled that ministry, but the, the fact that they've said they intend to, I think is quite a worrying sign as well. So would that be the ministry that, would, that did 20 odd years ago stop people from playing music and stop any sort of form of popular entertainment? Do you expect that to come back? Well, uh, the fact that they've announced that they are going to resurrect that ministry uh, would seem to, to indicate that that's at least in discussion. One of the things we need to remember, and that I think is well reflected in this interim government, is that the Taliban is not a unitary whole, that there are different factions within the Taliban, and that it is a precarious moment, both for Afghanistan generally, but also for the Taliban itself. And so there's quite a bit of jockeying within the organization as they try to divvy up, as it were, the spoils of war. I expect that it's going to remain a dynamic situation as we move forward with a great deal of potential for violence. By no means is this settled. And I think this is something that many observers will be watching in the coming days and weeks. Do you think there's going to be an acceptance from the population at large over the coming months about their uh, new situation living under this new government? I mean, we've had reports of some sort of protests going around, on around in different locations. We had a lady here in the studio last week who is a, an Afghan-American, but originally from Herat, mm -hmm. saying that she has heard accounts back in her home province of women committing suicide rather than living under the Taliban's rule. I think anyone connected with Afghanistan has heard a number of reports uh, of similar tone and tenure, which is quite, uh, quite disturbing, obviously. Um, the Taliban, on the one hand, has a population which is war-weary, and that, as it were, can, can benefit the Taliban. But at the same time, um, the real challenge for the Taliban is now that they have seemingly won the war, and I say seemingly because I'm not sure that the war is over. I think their quick conquest may, in fact, uh, end up having been rather illusory. But having won the war, um, I think they're going to find that governing and ruling the country is quite a different matter altogether. And the Taliban, in fact, is really poorly equipped to do that. You know, we hear these uh, numbers of approximately 75,000 fighters in the Taliban. 
but that does not give them the competence to run a state. They don't have the bureaucracy. They don't have the know-how. They don't understand how a state functions. If anything, their period in governance in 1996 to 2001 previously demonstrated their lack of ability to run a state. And so I think that's, that's a really important thing to remember. The other thing is that there are certain conditions that any Afghan government is going to face, whether it be the previous Ghani or Karzai administrations or the present Taliban administration or whoever comes after them. The first and most important is that Afghanistan has always been reliant upon a foreign subsidy. At no point over the last century has foreign subsidy constituted less than a quarter of the Afghan national budget. In fact, the 2019 budget of the Ghani government, 60 percent was from foreign sources. That's just a hard reality of governing Afghanistan, and in part explains the desperation the Taliban feel um, to get international recognition. They need to turn on the spigot in terms of uh, foreign support. The other major issue is, of course, um, you have a population, the majority of which was actually born after 2001. They have no memory of a previous Taliban rule. They have formed certain expectations of how a state should behave and what it owes them. And in fact, the failure to live up to those expectations was in part what accounts for the weakness of the Ghani government. It was unpopular because it didn't uh, deliver on the population's expectations. The Taliban must be aware of that. And if they fail to deliver on those expectations, it will be a very dangerous situation for them indeed. Benjamin, thank you so much indeed. Really, really interesting to hear your analysis. Benjamin Hopkins is a professor at George Washington University.